The master path is, is extraordinarily unique and it's revolutionary. And I feel rather inept to be able to come up here and talk to you about something so profound and moving and far reaching as the master path really is. I know you people are very patient with me. I do the best I can. I love what I do. But the system that is used to bring the soul back to its homeland is so exalted and far reaching that I don't think words of any nature could fully embrace or define what it is. So please bear with me. I would like to give you a few points on what the master path is not. Point number one, the master path does not rely on ascended masters. That's a cardinal principle in the light and sound teachings. This must be contrasted to other paths where they do rely on ascended masters. Buddha was here 2,500 years ago. Jesus the Christ was here 2,000 years ago. Muhammad was here 1,300 years ago. Krishna was here maybe 4,000 years ago. All these great people, these great teachers and saints are no longer with us, yet major religions and doctrines have been formulated around them. But the help that one can get from relying on an ascended master is not the same help that you can receive with a living master. Point number two, the master path does not brand their followers with being sinful. This is another cardinal principle because on many of our paths, they use the fear tactic. And if you are a sinner, then the chances aren't very good that you're going to get very far in your life. You're always under an umbrella of depression or somehow falsely living your life. And they brand one a sinner with a punishment at the end of this as well. And it's very important to me that the new seekers understand that on this path, no one is a sinner. You are a soul, and you're a son and a daughter of God. Number three, there are no churches, temples, or ashrams on the master path. There are no yogic postures or difficult austerities. There is no threat of eternal damnation. This teaching is not for the masses, but it's for the individual alone. I'm trying to contrast dear one's master path with conventional doctrines. It's for the individual alone. There's this false idea where the collective masses will ascend into heaven, whether it's the rapture or some other doomsday story, where everyone will ascend as a collective whole. And this is not true at all. It's very much like leaving high school. You leave because you're done. But everyone else stays there. And the school carries on. We will be judged. We will be assessed in an individual way. And whatever our family does, our friends do, or the fellow civilization that we are living within has no bearing at all up upon our own individual condition once we leave this earth plane. The master path does not advocate prayer or meditation, but rather contemplation. <coughs> If I could give a minute to this, prayer is very beneficial for so many people, and I respect those people that can pray. But when you're talking about expanding your consciousness, rising into higher levels, 
I must reluctantly tell you that a prayer offered to God isn't really heard. You're praying to your own divine mind within you. And whatever benefits and grace and mercy you receive through the constructs of prayer has come from your own higher mind within you and not God itself. Many, many people feel that they have a personal relationship with God. And I hate to crash anyone's party, but it's just more difficult than that. God is very exalted. And to even brush up next to him or to be an acquaintance of the supreme deity takes a long time and much, much unfoldment in consciousness. Meditation was very big back in the Indian days. The culture, the people, the level of education, the limitation of books were so limited that meditation was actually a beautiful practice in which to engage in. But in the 21st century, it's no longer in vogue. It takes too much time. It's too rigid. Contemplation is the better way. The master path does not advocate abstinence, but moderation in all things. Now, to me, this is just beautiful, especially if an American is listening to this. <laughs> Many times, even the light and sound teachings in the East have been represented as complete abstinence of sex, meat, recreational drugs, alcohol, no doubt, the purer you are, the higher and faster you unfold. But to lay those vows and those conditions on the American people is not going to fly. They're too fast paced. Their time is already taken up with other details. And so not only do we need a spiritual exercise that condenses time and space, which contemplation does, but we need to be able to have a lifestyle that fits in with the 21st century. The master path is not a religious institution nor an external organization. It has no seat of power in the outside world. This is in contrast to other doctrines, to repeat myself. Other doctrines and bless every one of them, because each one has a divine purpose. But they feel a responsibility and a need to reflect what they represent in a physical structure, such as a church, an ashram, a temple, a synagogue. And eventually, it reduces the teachings to an external affair. And what happens is the people that are devotees of these various other paths end up going to these buildings. They're enshrined, they're sacred, and their worship is conducted in these buildings. Master Path believes that all worship should be in your own inner temple, that the best ashram in the world is right up here in your third eye, that the best looking temple Church, synagogue, resides right inside your own consciousness. And so the master path has no outside churches or temples or shrines of any kind. The master path has no missionaries, nor does it attempt to coerce, persuade, or convert anybody. To me, this is a beautiful principle of the master path and how broadly it looks at other experiences and states of consciousness. Conventional paths usually go out and they want to convert at all costs. We've all heard the knock on the door. And here's the missionaries and they want to talk to us about God and their path. I respect them for their boldness and their courage and their enthusiasm. But whenever you are going to try and convert another person to your faith, then it insinuates that you really don't feel comfortable 
about your own relationship to that faith. How can you really convert someone else if you yourself haven't been fully converted or do not fully believe in those tenets? So I want you new seekers to know, and the Chilas as well, that we do not try and convert anyone on this path. We let that person have their own karmic experience, and we realize that wherever they are at, it is absolutely perfect relative to that individual. We do not try and persuade someone. You won't hear me trying to persuade you. I will become very impassionate in what I say. I'm very fueled and enthusiastic. But to try and turn a trick or coerce you to follow this path just to build up numbers, it's not acceptable. And so on the master path, we let everyone be as they are. And we learn the talent of not backing someone in a corner and using pressure techniques, but we give them enough room to hear what we are saying, to think and contemplate what we have said to them. And we give them enough time to turn around if they feel they want to. Nor does the master path attempt to brainwash children. Is it fair to take a baby in the crib and start teaching them about the Bible and the Holy Rosary and certain spiritual principles, confining their thoughts into one path or one channel and not giving them the full perspective? Is it right to convince a child of what their religion should be before they have even grown up and before they can comprehensively look at the doctrine themselves? Why, of course it's not. And so I want the seekers to know here that Master Path does not condone brainwashing a child. And we say that that child has to become old enough, has to experience enough of the world, so they can make their own decision if they ever come to that time and want to do so. OK. The master path does not involve itself with social gatherings, at least to my knowledge. <laughs> Charities, outreach programs, rituals, or ceremonies. That seems to be a mainstay with other doctrines because the meat of true spirituality really isn't there. And they need to fill up one's time with other activities. And this is where we get into rituals and ceremonies. Or there has been some pure spiritual truth that through time has lost its luster and its spiritual impact, and it's been reduced to a ceremony. Drinking of grape juice or eating of bread, counting the beads, standing on one leg, fasting for weeks, refusing to sleep, silence, None of these things really help in expanding your level of consciousness, and the master path doesn't have anything to do with them. No restrictions on the master path concerning gender, concerning sexual preference, nationality, past spiritual training, nor does the master path denigrate or demean or find disfavor with any other doctrine. And I mean all of them, witchcraft included. And then someone says, Gary, how about atheism? No problem. Hey, there are many people that don't believe in God at all. That's a very valuable experience to go through. One cannot slight someone or judge them for that stance. There's plenty of evidence, at least in their own mind, to come up with that conclusion. And I want the seekers to know, and those that will eventually hear this tape, to know that we do not denigrate or find fault with any other path. Every path has its purpose, its level, and all paths serve in one way or another to eventually bring the individual back home.